You want to be financially free. And so it really speaks to the vast difference there is between being debt free and being financially free. And I, that's something that I've talked about and I've written about in some articles like in Forbes and things like that, where, you know, I think a lot of people think, oh, I pay off all my debt and then I'm good. But if you pay off all your debt, but you don't have any money coming in, uh, you're, you're not in such a great situation. I would rather be in a situation where I have responsible debt. And I don't say that, you know, don't be irresponsible. But if you can responsibly leverage your deals, you can have money coming into you. You're listening to Ice Cream with Investors, a podcast that is dedicated to teaching you how to better invest your money so that you can live a more intentional life. I'm your host, Matt Four, and it is my goal to teach and empower you to remove the roadblocks to your financial success. Welcome back to Ice Cream with Investors. I'm your host, Matt Four, and on today's show, we have Matt Pacheni. Matt is a full-time real estate investor based out of Brooklyn, but that's not where he got his start. Matt actually got his start on the stages of Broadway before moving into project management roles and then becoming a full-time real estate investor. In his book, Your Backstage Guide to Passive Investing, Matt highlights keystone concepts that we can all learn about real estate and wealth. And in today's episode, he highlights three of those concepts. Stick around and listen to how Matt's journey from the stages of Broadway to becoming a full-time real estate investor and the challenges he faced along the way. All right, Matt, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Well, we like to start with the difficult questions. What's your favorite ice cream? Yeah, you know, I mean, I've been dreading that. I feel like the rest (laughs) of this interview will go great (laughs) because how do you pick a favorite ice cream? You know, I think the one that I that I want the most, that I miss the most. I I live in Brooklyn, New York, and there's a, a a company here called Ample Hill Creamery, and they made and it was like a random thing and i hear they make it some sometimes but it's really hard to find but they make this pistachio ice cream that's yeah. like incredible and it has like caramel in it and it's just it's really unique and amazing and very rare to find so i guess i'll go with that one I, there's just there's so many to choose from it's really hard to make a decision is ample hill still a creamery in the brooklyn area it is it is they have a couple of locations uh, around the area that I live. Um, I believe though, that is no longer owned by the people who used to own it. It's been purchased by a a company. And, uh, I think that the, maybe the flavors don't change as much. That's why maybe I can't find that pistachio. Um, but yeah, it's still there. It's still delicious. Well, I love New York city. So next time I'm up that way, I'll make sure to go find it. Well, if you're going to Ample Hill, let me know. I'll go with you. There you go. There you go. Two mats, one creamery. There Um, you go. (laughs) <laughs> well, tell our listeners, what's the scoop? What do you do today? So I'm a real estate investor, um, but I didn't start off that way. I started off as an actor. I moved to New York. I grew up in Orlando, Florida, and I moved to New York to pursue a career in theater. And I was a professional actor for five years. I was in 15 different productions all across the United States. And then I was doing some computer stuff here and there. And this is you know the mid to late 90s. And uh, instead of waiting tables at the Hard Rock Cafe in between acting gigs, I was doing HTML. Um, and more and more work came in and I eventually ended up starting my own boutique agency. And so in the late 90s, I had my own agency. It was great. It was a small agency. I had five employees and we were doing websites and, and things were great. And then 2001 came along and the dot-com bubble burst. And all of my clients went out of business or weren't spending money in digital marketing. And my business like completely imploded. I mean, it was bad. And uh, I, I was fortunate enough to get a phone call right at that time from my landlord who told me I had 90 days to get out of the apartment I was living in. So here I am with uh, no job, a, a business that has completely failed. Uh, basically nowhere to live. And I I had to find a place to live. Um, I I was looking to rent something. I ended up searching all over New York and I found a place up in Washington Heights, which is, which is Manhattan, but it's upper, 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 upper Manhattan, way, way, way uh, uh, up North. And, but I found a place and I actually bought it. Um, It was relatively, I was able to, to make a purchase And about two and a half years later, a little less than two and a half years later, I sold that property 
And I saw my initial investment in the property more than quadruple in value. Wow. Yeah, that's what I said. I was like, wow, how do I make that happen again? Because that, you know, I, I was making a good salary at that time. Um, but that one transaction was more than my a whole year's worth of salary. So um, that's what set me down the path of, you know, wanting to figure out, okay, well, what's, what's this real estate investing game and how do I get involved? Um, and, and so I did for about 10 years do that as a hobby, small little projects here and there. Um, and then about seven years ago, um, my wife got a really cool job opportunity in Miami, Florida. We moved to Miami. And when we made that move, that's when I transitioned from doing real estate as a hobby on the side to becoming a full-time real estate investor. And so that's what I do now. Two thirds of my portfolio are deals that I'm investing passively in. So I'm a limited partner and other people run those deals. And then a third of my portfolio, almost 4,000 units are deals that I am the general partner on. Uh, and I, I'm actively involved in those deals and, and making sure that they're running smoothly. That's awesome. I I, I want to go back to their first purchase there. Sure. N- New York is historically known for being a very expensive place to go purchase a home, specifically a first home. Um, yeah. Why did you decide to make that decision? What type of home was it? Was it a single family, multifamily? So what I bought was I bought an apartment in a co-op building. Uh, so for those who don't know what it is, a, a co-op, it's sort of like a condo. You, you, you actually invest... So technically you're investing in a company and then you're given a proprietary lease, which then gives you access to your uh, exclusive access to your unit. Um, But you're not like buying the unit. It's kind of weird. So that, that was the first purchase that I made. It was, it it turned out to be a really good investment. I think the investment was really good because of, uh, because of timing, Um, you know, the real estate market, was doing really well in New York at that time. I also have bought an apartment in a part of town that was rapidly being developed. You know, right before I moved in there, they opened up a Starbucks around the corner, you know, Uh so there was things happening in that area. And also because of the work that I did at the property, you know, I I just kind of instinctively like fixed up the unit because it you know, there was like cracks in the walls and needed some paint and things like that. But the building itself really needed work. It looked super dated. And I spoke to somebody who was on the co-op board and they were, it turned out that they happened to be forming a committee. Uh, and they asked me if I wanted to be on it. So I was on this committee and we hired an interior designer and we redid the lobby and redid the hallways and the elevators and everything. And the place looked like way better than when I had bought it. And that's what really, I think, helped, you know, all, all those factors combined really helped uh, lift the, the the value of that property. You're doing value add before value add was cool. But before I knew what value add mm-hmm. was, it's funny when I learned about value add, You know, I have a book that I wrote. I talk about it in the book. I'm like, and then I found out about value add and I realized, hey, I had instinctively been doing it, you know, for for a few different things that I had worked on before I knew it was actually like a thing. Yeah. So you you then moved down to Miami, decide to go real estate full time and move away from some of the project management, digital services you were providing. Um, Do you remember what what year was that? Uh, Twenty. 15, we moved down in like September of 2015. Um, And, you know, to be honest with you, I first moved down there and I I talk about this in the book too. I first moved down there thinking I was going to get a job in, in the digital marketing advertising world. That, that was my initial intention. And the first, you know, three, four months that we were down there, I was sort of banging my head against the walls. It was weird because in New York, just having been here so long and worked at many, you know, I just, I got recruited out of one company into another, out of another, into another. like, it just, that's how it happened. Like, I, I don't think I ever was looking for a new job. I would end up getting like a phone call from a recruiter with this like awesome opportunity and end up taking it. Um, in Miami, I had no network. Yeah. And yeah. none of the companies that were in New York were like, had anything down there. And so it was like trying to break into sort of a new territory. But honestly, I was burned out. Like I had been doing the New York City grind for 18 years. And I just, I didn't want to do it anymore. 
And I had been doing real estate pretty successfully as a hobby for 10 years. And I, I wanted to do that. And I, I was listening to an audio book. I was listening to Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I'm sure a lot of Never heard of the book. What, what's that about? Like, what? <laughs> Who? Um, and right. So my big takeaway was like, okay, I need to create these multiple streams of passive income. And, you know, he's always talking that he says, you know, real estate's really good for that. And here I've been doing the real estate thing, but no, you know, I'm going to get the job in the advertising world. But then I'm also listening to the cast album of Hamilton um, because we're, we're huge fans of Hamilton. We also invested in it, which is a whole other story that we can talk about. But I'm, you know, I'm listening to Hamilton and there's a song called My Shot where he's talking about taking his shot and the whole cast is like, take your shot, take your shot, like in the background, you know? And I just was like, what am I doing? Like, why am I trying to get a job in advertising? I don't want to do it. I'm burned out. I need to take my shot and do this real estate thing full time. And, and that's what I did. And fortunately it's, it's worked out pretty well for the past seven years. So it's been good. Do you, do you remember roughly what your portfolio looked like at that time? Like, were you still oh, yeah. doing active fix and flips? Did you have some passive investing? What did all that look like? Sure. Uh, at that time, when I sat down with my wife and said, Hey, starting January 1, 2016, I'm going to be a real estate investor. What do you think? We had, um, we had three streams of passive. Well, we had two streams of passive income with one that was a potential. So we had a um, a townhouse that my wife and I had bought um, about a year and a half prior in Brooklyn, which was an awesome deal. And we I knew when we bought it that if we ever moved out, it would cash flow. It cash flowed very nicely. Um, so we had that as one stream of passive income. I had a property that I had bought. So after the place in Washington Heights, I bought a place on the Upper West Side. And so that was my primary residence, but that's when I bought my first investment. And it was a piece of property up in Connecticut that I ended up developing and, and, and creating a, a, one, a single family home. It was a one acre of land that I bought, almost an acre. And that was going to be a vacation home and I thought I would rent it out at the very beginning. I was like, well, that helped defray my costs a little bit. Ended up being that I just rented it the whole time. Like I never was up there more than like a weekend here or there, but it, it was a rental. Um, and so it, that deal never cash flowed. Um, I was about break even every year, but it was never underwritten to do that. But I thought, okay, well, I got the town home in Brooklyn, the Connecticut house, maybe I can make that, you know, cash flow positive eventually, like who knows how long, but, you know, at a 30 year fixed mortgage. So maybe as over time, as rents would go up, you know, whatever. And then um, we had invested in, in Hamilton and that was doing well. It's still doing well to this day. Um, and so we had passive income coming from there. So that was really my portfolio at that time. I was, could, you know, I would buy properties. I bought some single families, but those were more like fix and flips. So, but the portfolio that I had at that time, like right when we moved down, was just those those three passive investments. So you essentially had three, but you had been doing these projects where you would get a lump sum of cash along the way. Am I understanding that correctly? Well, no, not really. I the 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 projects that I had been doing were were much smaller. By the time I got involved in when we had moved down to to, to Florida. That that's when I really started doing like the fix and flips and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, the large chunks of change were not so large. <laughs> the, yeah. lump, the large lump sums weren't so large. Sometimes they were, and sometimes they were negative, you know, and I'd have to, you know, it, it, I, I, I learned pretty quickly that I didn't really want to continue doing that. I wanted something that was a little more predictable, um, and a little more uh, stable and steady, you know, with flipping, with, with flipping properties, you, it's very hard to find them. Everybody, especially nowadays, and even back then, like all those shows that are out there, like everyone thinks they can flip properties. And the problem is the, the properties get bid up, you know, the price yep. on them gets bid up and it's really hard to find a good deal. And then you find a good deal and you have to do everything. 
and then you sell it and then you're done. And so it's very, you know, the, the way that I looked at it, if I wanted to replace the salary that I had previously working in a, you know, nine to five, really way more than nine to five, the hours I worked, but that sort of, you know, W2 job, I probably was going to need to flip a property like every month, maybe every other month, but probably- Which is hard to do. Well, yeah, how am I going to get that? And then how many construction crews am I going to, you know, like I hired some guy who did construction stuff who was like fixing the houses for me. It wasn't, I, he didn't have a crew. Like, how was I going to get, how was I going to be doing more than one at any given time? And I was doing, I wasn't even doing them. So I was living in Miami. I wasn't doing this in Miami. The the the, the price point in Miami didn't make sense for me. So I was doing this in, in Ohio, actually. Um, I have relatives that live in the, the Akron, Cleveland area, right? So we were in, in that sort of area is where I was flipping these properties. So, you know, it wasn't in my backyard and it was not uh, an easy thing to do. And so I got started finding out about real estate syndications, right? Where investors are pooling their money together and going after these investments and started investing in those and, and doing both paths, paths at the same time, right? I was looking to be an active investor and, and be a general partner in those deals and run those deals, but also looking to invest passively. And, um, the passive stuff was easier to do because all I needed to do was find a deal that I felt comfortable with and invest in those. And I invested, I think, in, in five deals before I sponsored my first deal. It took me two years to find my first deal to sponsor. But here's the here's the thing is once I knew that once I had a deal that I was going to sponsor, I wasn't going to only be into that deal for like, you know, a few months and be out of it. These types of deals we've been underwriting them for like five to seven years now now the real estate market's been incredibly robust over the past several years so most of the deals that i've been in have not lasted more i don't think i've had a deal that i've been in on the multifamily for three years like i think they've all been under three years um as an active there's some passive ones that have been longer but uh, but but the plan is that these things are going to last five, seven years. So instead of hunting for that one property to flip to make a little bit of money that I'm only going to be working on for three to six months, why don't I take that same amount of time and energy and put it into trying to find multifamily? Now, it turns out it took just as long or even longer to find multifamily deals. But then that deal is something that I can work on for five years and then yep. get more over time right, and build up a portfolio. Yeah, it's a common misconception out there that active real estate syndicators or investors or flippers or wholesalers don't also passively invest as well. And you and I are similar there where I've got an active portfolio that I actively manage and syndicate and run, but then I also have a passive portfolio as well. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about like why did you decide if you were flipping houses or doing things in Northeast Ohio and also trying to get involved in real estate syndications, did you decide to passively invest as well? And then I want to go into like how you determined which operators to go with? So I joined one of these mentorship groups that you've, you know, that there's there's many of them out there. If people want to do that, just be really careful who you get involved with, because I think some are not so good. I, I fortunately was in a good one. Um, so that was nice. And um, there I met people who were doing deals and I liked the deals and I had some money that I had saved up over the years and wanted to do something with it, number one. Number two, I wanted to sponsor my own deals and what better way to learn how to do it than start investing in some deals, you know? I mean, I definitely learned more when I was actually doing deals, right? Mm -hmm. But second best option, I think, is is to go ahead and invest passively. You can learn a lot from that. And, and I invested with different operators. And so I was able to see how they worked with um, their investors. Uh, they had, some of them had different syndication attorneys. So I would get exposed to different like PPMs and operating agreements um, and see different, get to under, realize there's nuances between these things. They're not all exactly the same. Um, and also see how those sponsors were communicating 
with their uh, investors. And I mean, I, my investor communication, uh, I think, you know, I pat myself on the back. I think it's really good. And part of it is because I kind of stole a little bit from this guy and a little bit of, from that girl and, and said, you know, I like not, not, not really stole, which is like, Oh, I like the fact that they do X, Y, and Z. I'm going to do that when I have my deal. And I like that this one does that. So I'm going to do that as well. So investing passively was a way for me to put my money to work in something that I felt that I believed in actually see it working. Um, and also kind of learn from that. Yeah. You, from my understanding, you have several thousand doors that you've actively syndicated and passively invested in. Can you tell us a little bit about like what makes a good operator and what makes some of those poor operators or some of the things you look for and have implemented into your syndications? Sure. Yeah. I've invested in over 7,000 units as a passive investor and then actively uh, I'm getting close to 4,000 units. Um, And so, yeah, I do have, you know, a bit of experience doing that and, and, and I'm able to see uh, things from kind of both sides of the fence, which I think is really helpful. Um, And when it comes to vetting syndications, you know, that's, that's the thing that I get asked the most about. That's why I actually ended up writing my book backstage guide to real estate to help people with that. I also have like a free resource on my website. You go to my website on the first page right there, there's a thing free download, uh, quickly sizing up a syndication so that that people can do that. And what I talk about in that Uh, in that PDF and also in the book is that there's, there's three things that I want to look at when I'm looking at a syndication. I want to look at the sponsor. I want to look at the market and I want to look at the deal. And the most important of those three things is the sponsor. You know, who is that sponsor? How did you meet them? You know, if, if I'm talking with, with a good friend and they're like, Hey, you know, I invested in, 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 in this guy's deal and you know it was awesome and we made all this money and he was wonderful the communication was great you know then I say to my friend hey you know introduce me to this this guy I want to meet him um if I get like a random you know Facebook LinkedIn message yeah. or LinkedIn LinkedIn is actually slightly better than the you know when I get the Facebook messenger then I'm just like okay a big red flag. I mean, LinkedIn's bad too, but but the red Facebook Messenger one, I just am like, who is this Yahoo? Um, you know, reaching out to me, and you know, I'm sure that there are some good reputable people out there who are reaching, doing outreach through LinkedIn. I've contemplated maybe doing it at some point, but you know, all the ones that I get are just super like, hey, you know, they're just too salesy. Uh, uh, if someone were to reach out to me and want to start to develop a relationship with me and get to know who I am and then maybe present a deal to me in the future. That's a little bit more kind of my speed from some random guy on the internet than, you know, someone reaching out. I got this great deal. I never met you before. That's weird. Um, So that's one of the things I look, you know, you want to look for, you know, the sponsor. How did you meet them? What, what is their track record? Have they done deals? You know, do they have deals that have actually gone full cycle? You know, I'm, I'm proud to say that I've got, you know, six properties now um, across three different syndications that I've done because I've done some portfolio type deals that have gone full cycle and like all of them have exceeded expectations. Um, So that's, you know, it's been great. But there's people out there just they've never had a deal, you know, go from the purchase through the operations through the sale. And then it's kind of like, all right, well, can they actually Excuse. perform, you know, yep. and maybe they can. I'm not saying you can't, but if someone's got a track record and has been able to do it a few times now, it, you know, you kind of can feel a little more comfortable with that. Yeah. Let, let's let go into your book for a second. You've referenced it sure. a couple of times. And one of the things that is in your book are these concepts and keystones, as you call them. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of those keystones and what you found success in? Yeah. So real quick, the, the impetus for the book was trying to help people be able to sort of look at syndications. And I wrote this book and it was like really boring. It was all technical. And I, I, I don't think anyone would enjoy reading it. It's like, chewing on cardboard. It was terrible, yeah. terrible book. And I, I I wanted to make it something that people could read and sort of read wherever they are in their real estate journey. And so what I decided to do is take all the stuff that was in that, in that 80 pages that I had written and 
pepper it out through sort of my experience and all the things that I was sort of teaching people, that's when I came up with this idea of these keystone concepts, was sort of teach them as I learn them through my path. So the, the book is really my journey from being an actor, knowing nothing about real estate, all the way to where I am now. And the book starts off with simple things like what's an asset and what's a liability. And at the end of the book, I'm doing an air rights deal and a 1031 exchange, right? So it kind of runs the gamut. There's 60 different real estate terms that are defined throughout the whole book. But through the book, I, I share those 18 different keystone concepts. And actually on my website, if you go to the book page, you can download a thing that gives you details on three of those keystone concepts. And so I'll tell you what those three are. So the first one is uh, keystone concept number one, which is um, don't trade your time for money. Uh, you know, you can always generate money, but you can't actually like generate time. It's finite. And so if you can figure out ways to have your money working for you and you don't not having to work, you know, trade your time for that then you have your time free to do whatever you want, right? That That's essentially keystone concept number one. Um, keystone concept number five is um, cash flow is king. So, you know, my dad told me, uh, you never lose money in real estate if you never have to sell. Which I like, is like dad. Really, It's really simple, but it's like really profound. He told me that when I bought that, that co-op up in uh, Washington Heights. And I heard it and I was like, okay, dad, whatever. But then I bought, you know, I sold that property. I bought the place on the Upper West Side. And then the 2008 crash came and I saw the value of the property that I bought. And I had gone up quite a bit. So when, when, the, when the prices came down, it came down to about what I had purchased it at. So I wasn't like underwater, thank goodness. A lot of people were. Um, but I was like, wow, like, he's so right. Like, as long as I don't sell it now, I'm okay. I just got to make that mortgage payment. And that really has formed the backbone of, you know, my investment strategy. I'm always looking for deals that have strong, positive cash flow. Because that cash flow then gives you that, that cushion that you need to be able to ride out the inevitable dips that you're going to have in market cycles, right? I and mean, we're going into a dip, it looks like now, as we're recording this podcast, looks like we're going into a dip. And, you know, I have good, solid cash flowing properties, and that allows me to um, be able to hopefully, we'll see what happens, but hopefully weather the storm, right? I want to put an asterisk on that too and say your cash flow needs to not be dependent on you not setting aside reserves. So you always need to have a operating reserves, I think, when you own property, because it's not a matter of if something will go wrong, it's when. And it should not be based on, oh, we know that we can bump rents 25% like we saw in 2021 in certain markets. You should assume today, what are rents today? Can I cash flow positive while setting aside a reserve? So I, I wholly believe in that concept of cash flow is king because it gives you options. And as long as you don't sell, you don't lose. So thank you for highlighting that one. What was the third one? So the third one is, um, it's called, you want to be financially free. And so it really speaks to the vast difference there is between being debt-free and being financially free. And I, that's something that I've talked about and I've written about in some articles like Forbes and things like that, where, you know, I think a lot of people think, oh, I pay off all my debt and then I'm good. But if you pay off all your debt, but you don't have any money coming in, uh, you're, you're not in such a great situation. I would rather be in a situation where I have responsible debt and I don't say that, you know, don't be irresponsible, but if you can responsibly leverage your deals, you can have money coming into you. Um, I tell a story in the book about this guy um, uh, who I know, this is, it's like a true story, all the, all the stories in the book are true stories, it's a true story about this guy I know named Aaron. Awesome guy, really cool, very smart real estate investor. And he has a bunch of properties and he's like, yeah, I'm going to retire. You know, he had just, after I had met him, he had just gotten done uh, refinancing his portfolio. He has like about 10 properties in a really affluent area and he gets very good cash flow, like really good cash flow. 
And he's like, yeah, you know, once these, once this is paid off, I just refinance everything into a 15 year portfolio mortgage. And once this thing is paid off, like, then I'm done. Like I'll have so much cash flow. Right. And I was like, Aaron, that's great. But like, what about the next 15 years? And he's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, next 15 years, a lot of things that can happen. You know, I, I don't know about you, but like, I don't know that I'm, I'm going to be, look, look, I'll put my cards on the line for you, Matt. Like I'm 49. I'm going to be 50 in March, right? It's so like when I'm 65, I don't know that I'm going to be able to do the same things that I could do at 50. Maybe That's I right. can. I hope I stay healthy, but you know, you know, who knows? And so, you know, life happens. And also he's like having to work his, you know, fingers to the bone doing his other job that he has, which I know he likes. His thing is, well, 15 years versus 30 years, like the mortgage payments that I'm going to make, uh, the interest alone is going to be like a million dollars. I break this down in the book and, and kind of debunk it because if he takes, if he were to get those lower mortgage payments and then actually either use that money to improve his lifestyle or just invest that money, if he just invests that money, he'll actually make way more than the million that he's going to be paying extra. So it, it, it doesn't really make sense, but that's the way we're all taught. And Aaron is super smart. We've had many conversations about it. And he actually, last time I spoke with him, he's like, you know what, Matt? I'm like 80% of the way there on your thinking. I'm not 100% yet, but I'm 80% of the way there because he just never thought of it that way because we're not taught that. We're taught, pay off your debts, you know? And if you have good debt, that responsible debt, then it can help you build wealth faster, but it's got to be done responsibly. Yeah, I remember that first time I did an analysis of 15 versus 30. And if you invest the difference between the 30-year note and the 15-year note at an annual 7%, just average return, it'll be way more than it was at 30 uh, if you had just taken out the 30 note or the 15-year note. So it's it's unlearning the habits that we were taught by people that wanted to control our money and they thought they could control it better than us. Yeah. And, and even more than that, you know, in the, in that PDF that I talked about, that's on the website, on the book page, I give an example of like leveraging to buy investment properties. And like one example is you buy a property. I think it was like, a, I don't remember the example I used, but I think it was like a, it, it was basically you buy one property and you pay for it completely, or you buy another property and you get debt on it and you put 25% down. And having the four properties over a five-year period versus the one property, they appreciate at the same rate, and you have a lot more money at the end with yep. the four properties versus just the one. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I want to put a big star on everything we're saying and just say we're two mats on the internet right now, right? We don't we don't know anything. Don't take our financial advice because I, <laughs> at the end of the day, think that the financial decisions you should make around investing and how you run your personal economy is a mix between math and emotion. If you can go to sleep at night knowing that your property is paid off and it's owned in cash, then by all means, do that. But math is going to tell you a different answer. But if you're so analytical on your math sense that you can't sleep at night because you know you've LTV'd your properties up into the max and if one little blip happens in your, your journey that you're going to be losing sleep... That's also probably not the right decision. So I love this conversation that we're having because it is a mix of both. And when you run the numbers, math will tell you a story, but never turn down the fact that if it makes you sleep better at night, that that's probably the right decision for you. Well, and you also need to be conservative, right? Because things do come up that you haven't planned for, uh, like interest rates going up by 3%, right? I mean, there are different things that happen. And I think it's good that you're mentioning that, that, that we're not giving advice. We're just two guys talking, two Matt's talking on the internet. Mm -hmm. But but um, these are good concepts to sort of think about and wrap your head around and then figure out what works best for your own particular situation. Yep, yep. You mentioned too, a couple of times, we're, we're recording this at the late 2022. I think 2023 is going to be a pretty rough year for a lot of different folks out there. How are you looking at your syndications, both actively and passively? Can you talk to us a little bit about assets, asset classes, and markets that you're looking at as we're kind of entering this choppy markets of 2023? Absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. I, you know, it's a big question mark for me. Um, I do have one project that I that I am uh, working on, so that that thing's going to continue on. I have. 
uh, a good portfolio of properties. Uh, we just sold one that did really well. So that was good. Um, but the, the, I, I'm not sure what 2023 is going to, to have in store. I, I have markets that I like that I've done in the past that I have good connections in. I do a lot in Texas. Um, and I continue to look at deals. The biggest question mark, I think moving into next year, um, is the financing component mm -hmm. of everything. Um, my underwriting, so like that deal that I just talked about, we we ended up selling a deal in, in, like last week. Uh, we were in for a little over two years. We were planning to hold it for five to six years because my underwriting, I've been thinking that we were going to see some headwinds in the market. And so I've been underwriting that way for years now. I'm surprised it took so long. Honestly, the lending environment at the moment is really in a state of flux. I know a number of lenders, I've, I've heard that as much as 75% of the lenders that are out there, and this is what I've heard, I don't know, this is a hard stat, have our pencils down through the end of the year and maybe into next year as well, meaning like they're not doing deals, they're not lending, or they're being really, really stringent about what they're lending on. Um, you know, loan to, to values are 50%, 60%, maybe 65. I don't think anyone's getting more than 65% leverage right now. Interest rates are high. If you're going for fixed rate debt, they're very high. If you're going for, you know, an, a variable rate, uh, a lot of lenders are requiring you to buy a rate cap which mm -hmm. rate caps are super expensive. What a rate cap is, for those who don't know, it's basically like you're buying insurance that the rates won't go above a certain amount. And if they do, that insurance basically pays you back. Um, and then you pay that to the, you know, you, you give that to the lender because your, your mortgage rate does, your mortgage payment still goes up. You're just getting this additional income. So those rate caps, I mean, you, people pay millions and millions of dollars just on rate caps. And then a lot of lenders are putting floors in because they see that rates could go down. And I, I, we can talk a little bit about that. I can pontificate about you know where things might go, but they're seeing that 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 rates could go down, so they're saying, all right, you, we're, we're going to give you floating rate debt, but it's not going to go below, you know, four percent, five percent, whatever the percentage is. It's usually a spread above a standard like SOFR, so they'll be like, so you know, yeah. two point three percent over SOFR. But actually, the spreads now are more like three percent, four percent, five percent over SOFR. They're crazy. So. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a very crazy environment. I think that eventually, um, hopefully in 2023, hopefully sooner rather than later, things will stabilize. I mean, these lenders, while they are pencils down because of there's so much in, in a state of flux, they make their money by lending. So they need to lend, right? So they need to figure out a way and products that make sense for them. And investors, we will need to figure out ways that make sense for us and then get back into the market. But right now I'm just, now I've got one project that I'm working on. I'm focused on that right now. And, um, you know, if we'll, we'll see what, what the future uh, lies in store. Yeah. Um, what you're really talking about here too, is liquidity dry, drying up in the system. And yeah. I think for the past at least two years, and I would take us all the way back to the GFC and the 2008, 2009 timeframe, when the only answer we had in our toolbox was to pump liquidity into the system. And where I'm trying to go with this point is for the past 12 years, a lot of folks have said, why do I need to set up lines of credit? Why do I need to have extra liquidity? Cash is trash. Get it all into the market, which in that time of, mark in that time of the market cycle made sense. However, we are now getting into a point where having liquidity not only means having cash, but access to cash. And that's one of the things I've been trying to say for the past four years to a lot of my friend group is you need to make sure that you have lines of cash that you can draw on so that you can make these investment decisions when we're in a down market and a recessionary cycle. But I don't want to breeze over. I would love to hear you pontificate on where you think interest rates are going. Um, but if you're a little strapped for time, we can also just transition us to our, our last round here. Well, you know, I'm just I'm going to be doing a webinar about it next week. I have you know, all kinds of charts and graphs. But you know the interesting thing to note um, is just a couple couple things real quick. Okay, uh, since World War II, recessions in the United States have lasted an average of ten months. 
Okay. Um, the other thing is in the past five tightening cycles, with the exception of the 1994 cycle, uh, the Fed once rates, once they stopped raising rates, they had to start bringing them down pretty quickly within nine months. So for those reasons, I don't think that this is going to necessarily be protracted. I'm not saying, hey, nine months from now, a recession will we'll have a recession, it'll be over and they'll be bringing the rates down. I'm not saying that. They don't know what's going to happen. Um, Mark Twain is known for saying uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And so, you know, I, I don't expect things to, 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 to follow exactly what they have in the past, but looking at the past, we can sort of extrapolate out for the future. I do think we're going to have a tough 12 to 24 months, but I do, you know, invest in real estate for the, for a longer term uh, than just two years. And so I think there's good buying opportunities even now and that there will be over the next couple of years. And I think that once we get out of this, uh, things will be good. Um, and so I, I feel bullish about real estate in general uh, when we're looking long term. Yeah, they'll, they'll, I agree with you on a lot of those data points and I've seen some similar statistics out there. The only two things I would add to that is you have to yeah. remember in the United States economy, the housing sector alone, when you're talking about construction, supplies, people, sales, lending, all of these sorts of things makes up about 25 to 30% of our economy. So everybody knows that, and we cannot go through a down cycle in a dramatic way in the housing industry, especially since there's a housing shortage, in my opinion. The second thing I think- Well, that it's, I'm it's seeing, not your opinion that there's a housing, just, just to be clear, the housing shortage is an opinion. That's that's fact. Right. Your opinion is that we can't go, right? Just because there's like a, a massive amount of demand that's needed. Well, and every city councilman right now is and woman is trying to figure out what do I do with this rising housing crisis that's going on, high, rising house prices crising, I guess, going on right now, because that directly affects them, directly affects them at the voters ballot box. And the only way to do it is to increase supply, um, in my opinion. Um, yep. The second yep. thing I would say is the United States right now is sucking liquidity out of the global economy. When you have rates in Europe that just are barely over 0.25, when you have rates in Japan that are around a percent and you have a dollar crisis around the world, all that liquidity in those economies are coming to the United States because they can get a risk-free 4% uh, rate right now that's climbing every single time the Fed meets. And that is also a problem that the United States has to monitor as well. So I think there's, for a lot of different reasons, it stinks right now if you're caught in this period of trying to acquire assets and you can't get the liquidity or you're facing rising interest rates. But I do agree with your point. Nine to 12 months, nine to 18 months, and this will we'll be on a better side of this. And real estate, to a further conversation that we've had earlier, goes up and to the right. The only time you really lose in real estate is you're, you're forced to sell. If you're forced because of cash flow situations, development situations, or you need the capital elsewhere. So long pontification there from this side of the Matt and Matt show today. <laughs> I love it. Um, Matt, well, fantastic conversation. I know we're, we're coming up on time here, so I want to be cognizant of that. I want to switch us now into our last round. We're calling this the five toppings. Our first okay. one is, what is your favorite book or what is a book that you've read recently that's given you a paradigm shift? Yeah, uh, besides Rich Dad, Poor Dad, besides my book, which is awesome. Yeah. Now, uh, Ray Dalio has a book called Principles for the Changing World Order that uh, was fan it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Yeah, I I believe that you should live your life in principles and he was the first person to write a book on it and there's no one that can do it better. So completely agree. Yeah. Our second one is, I believe that the person you become 10 years from now is directly correlated to the habits that you have and the things you do every day. What are some of the habits that you have? Oh, um, no good ones. No, uh, I, I don't have, I, I'm not really a, a person who has a lot of, I know people, some people have like a morning ritual or things like that. Uh, I try to spend as much time with my family as I can in the mornings and the evenings when they're here at the house. And then, you know, I, I guess I, you know, what I do, the way that I plan my whole days is I time block. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's oh, what yeah. I do. I just, I time block and that's, that's sort of the habit that I have, but it, it's, I do so many different things. I don't have like a common ritual type of thing. 
Maybe I should. Yeah. Time blocking is a good one though. <laughs> Our third one is what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? That I've ever received. Um, well, the thing from my dad, right? Uh, you, you never lose money in real estate if you never have to sell. Yep. Yep. I like it. Our fourth one is what are the thing? What is the thing that you're most proud of in your life? My kids. How many do you have? I have two adorable uh, girls. Yeah. So, How old are they? A five-year-old and an eight-year-old. Ah, oh, great ages. Yeah, great ages. They're a handful, which is which is a lot of fun. Um, yeah. they're they're amazing. Yeah. Oh, well, our last one is: if you could sit down and eat a bowl of ice cream with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be, and why? Honestly, Matt, I'd love to eat a bowl of ice cream with you. Hey. That is my goal, Matt, is that this show, we could be sitting in person, eating bowls of ice cream, just talking about real estate and economics. Let's do it. Come to New York. It. I love it. Well, Matt, fantastic conversation. Um, if our listeners wanted to reach out to you and learn more about you or get a copy of your book or download the uh, three um, keystones that we talked about earlier, where's the best place we could point them? Yeah, uh, those free downloads and other free content and and the book are all available uh, on my website, pacheni.com. I'll spell it really quick. It's P like in Peter, I C H E N Y.com. Perfect. Matt, thanks for coming on. Matt, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Ice Cream with Investors. If you like what we serve you here, it would mean the world to me if you would like, subscribe, and leave a review on your favorite podcast app.